Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Family History Today. Uh, this is the Centers uh, for Jewish History's monthly series of genealogy-themed public programs. My name is Moria Amit, and I'm the Senior Genealogy Librarian here at the Center for Jewish History. The Center provides a collaborative home for five partner organizations that together form the largest archive on the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. Uh, the Center, in addition, the Center houses the Ackman and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute, which strives to connect researchers to the wealth of genealogy resources at the Center and to make family history accessible to researchers of all ages, abilities, and levels of experience, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. The Genealogy Institute is open Monday through Thursday, 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. At the Institute, you will enjoy access to genealogy databases and reference books with our librarians and experienced volunteers on hand to provide guidance. We welcome walk-ins, but you still have the option to book an appointment at least one day in advance. If you're unable to visit in person, you may schedule a free 45 minute Zoom consultation with one of our genealogy librarians. Um, or you can email us at gi at cgh.org to ask for advice on your genealogy questions. In addition, you may continue to engage with us online in the following ways. Watch our genealogy co coffee break videos for brief tutorials on various topics, um, which is on the Center for Jewish History's Facebook page and YouTube channel. Check out the Center's program calendar at programs.cgh.org to find and register for future programs in our Family History Today series. And finally, Stay tuned for info on the spring semester of our 10-week Intro to Jewish Genealogy online class. Dates, other details, and link to uh, register will be posted on our website and elsewhere within a week or so. Uh, I just have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please send us your questions and comments anytime uh, during this program by using the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Please note, however, that our speaker will only answer your questions during the dedicated Q&A period. This program will be captioned, and if you'd like to view the captions, please click on the closed caption or CC button on the bottom of your screen, and then click show subtitles. Finally, this program will be recorded. You will receive a link to the video when we post it online in about two to three weeks. And finally, I'd like to make a correction. Uh, in the email I sent to all of you, I said that there is no handout for this program. Uh, uh, Serafima has uh, generously uh, provided a handout for this program. So you will receive an email with that handout either later today or tomorrow. So it's time to introduce today's speaker, who I'm happy to say has been uh, a featured speaker multiple times in in my series um, and so happy to have her back. Uh, Serafima Velkovich is the head of the Family Roots Research Section in the Reference and Information Department of Yad Vashem Archives Division and has been working at Yad Vashem for 17 years. She is also a PhD candidate at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and she is the author of a chapter called Polish Citizenship, Polish Citizenship as a Way to Freedom how Soviet Jews escaped the USSR by using Polish records, oh, sorry, Polish documents. This chapter was recently published in the book, Polish Jews in the Soviet Union, 1939 to 1959, History and Memory of Deportation, Exile and Survival, edited by Katharina Friba and Marcus Neseldot. So without further ado, um, Sima, I, I, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation. Just a second, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so, and I'm starting. Uh, I'm going today to present a general view um, on this um, very uh, important story of Polish Jews in the Soviet Union and also to give some uh, tips um, where it's possible to search uh, some details about um, Polish Jews who were in the Soviet Union during uh, the Holocaust. So I'll start from the um, early uh, beginning. The majority of Jews in pre-war Europe reside in Eastern Europe 
And of the Eve of the Nazi occupation, more than 3.3 million Jews lived in Poland and more than any other countries in Europe. The percentage among the general uh, population was also the highest in Europe, about 10%. The estimated number of Jewish population who were uh, killed during the Holocaust is about 3 million. Um, at the end of the war, approximately uh, 350,000 Polish Jews were still alive uh, in Poland, Soviet Union, uh, or in the concentration camps uh, in Germany, Austria, or Czech territories. Among the survivors, there were about uh, 230 a thousand who were deported or evacuated uh, to the Soviet Union. And actually, this is a topic of our uh, presentation today. Um, we are starting in 1939, uh, so called Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, uh, named after two foreign ministers who negotiated the agreement, um, had two parts. An economic agreement signed in August 19, 1939, provided that Germany would exchange manufactured goods with Soviet uh, raw materials. Nazi Germany and Soviet Union also signed a 10-year non-aggression pact uh, on August 23, 1939, in which each uh, signatory promised not to attack each other. Uh, the German-Soviet pact uh, enabled Germany to attack Polish, Poland in uh, September 1, 1939, without fear of Soviet intervention. Uh, the non-aggression pact uh, of August 23 uh, contained a secret protocol uh, that provided for the partition of Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe uh, into Soviet and German uh, sphere of interest. In accordance to this plan, the Soviet army occupied and annexed Eastern Poland in autumn 1939, uh, and it remained, uh, this pact remained in force uh, for nearly two years. Uh, until the German government of uh, Adolf Hitler ended the pact by attacking Soviet Union uh, and starting with Operation Barbarossa on June 22, 1941. So uh, new annexed territories um, by Soviets had a Jewish population about 2 million people, including uh, up to 300,000 Jewish refugees from Western Poland. Soon after the annexion, um, Moscow began a program of mass deportation of ethnic Poles as well as Polish Jews deep uh, into the Soviet interior. About half a million people um, of Polish civilians, including Polish Jews, were branded as social genders or anti-Soviet elements. Uh, they were forcibly removed uh, from their homes and were transported to labor camps and special settlements in Siberia, the Ural Mountains, Kazakhstan, and uh, other uh, distant parts of Russia, especially in the, on the north of Russia. There were several waves of deportations uh, during which families were sent to barren land in the Soviet Union. Uh, the categories of civilians were first talked by the NKVD included court judges, civil servants, staff of municipal government, members of Polish uh, police force, uh, former farmers, trade men, um, also uh, refugees from Western Poland, uh, children who were in summer camps and Polish orphanages, um, family members of those who were arrested by NKVD, and family members of anyone who escaped from the West and were missing. The exact number of Polish citizens who were uh, deported is not known. And uh, Polish government in exile um, believed that uh, the Soviets uh, had incarcerated approximately a million and a half uh, Poles, including about 30% uh, of them were uh, Jews. Uh, we don't know exact number, unfortunately. And I want to mention that researching this topic, unfortunately, we never can find uh, exact information about all these people. It's very seldom that we can uh, trace the whole route of the family um, who made this um, uh, journey, so-called journey uh, during World War II. So uh, if we're speaking about genealogical research, it's rather difficult topic for research. Because of that, I I'll try today to present um, 
uh, possible uh, ways of searching, but um, I'm not sure that it's possible, always possible to find the relevant materials. So, uh, as I mentioned, people were sent uh, to the camps, and those who were trialed, um, we have, we can find today uh, some of their uh, files, um, which uh, original files kept uh, in Ukrainian archives, but uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, had their copies. So, sometimes it's possible to find uh, this um, trial files in, in USHMM. So um, let's continue. Uh, after the Operation Barbarossa started, um, uh, but uh, uh, the Polish um, government in exile signed an agreement with the um, Soviet government on July 30, 1941. Um, Polish uh, Prime Minister uh, General Władysław Sikorski and Soviet Ambassador in the United Kingdom Iwan Maisky signed the sikorsky maisky Agreement, which uh, invalidated many of the territorial conditions of the molotov ribbentrop Pact. Uh, you can see here the photo of this um, very important for Polish Jews event in 41. Uh, what does it mean for Polish Jews? A new agreement ordered the reestablishment of Polish state, amnesty of Polish prisoners of war uh, in the Soviet Union on all Polish uh, prisoners who were in the uh, special settlements and uh, labor camps, and also the formation of Polish army on uh, Soviet soil. Here, for example, you can see um, uh, the approval um, the Polish former Polish citizen uh, received amnesty and um, this uh, paper is valid for three months and after that uh, this person has to uh, exchange this paper to the passport and this is how uh, one of the pages of passports how it looked like uh, this all uh, former uh, Polish citizens received Soviet, pa Soviet passports um, moving uh, from the camps. So um, I suppose many of you know, know that um, Polish Jews did not stay in the places uh, where the camps were. Majority of them started to move to the east, to the Central Asia. Um, but let's uh, start from the uh, army formation. This is very important event. Um, for forming a new Polish army not in, uh, was, uh, was not easy. Uh, because many Polish prisoners of war had died in labor camps in Soviet Union. Many of those who survived uh, were very weak from the conditions of the camp. But anyway, um, in August 41, uh, released from Moscow Lubyanka prison, uh, Polish General Vladislav Anders uh, began to mobilize the Polish armed forces uh, in the east and commonly known Anders Army. So, uh, according to uh, uh, agreement of Soviet and um, British government, uh, uh, after the occupation of Iran, it was allowed to this army formation to move from Soviet Union to Iran. Uh, together with Anders army, um, moved uh, to the east about four, uh, 74 um, Polish troops, and uh, they also included many refugees. There were about 116,000 refugees who were relocated to Iran. Majority of them were Poles, but there were approximately 6,000 6, Jews who were uh, Polish Jews who were included um, in this uh, wave of, of refugees. Uh, and there were about uh, 1,000 uh, Jewish orphanages, and I'll speak in a while about uh, all this trip that these children made uh, to Palestine. Um, so uh, I want also to mention that uh, some of the refugees uh, died in Tehran, and uh, still there is a Jewish cemetery there where their graves can be traced. Um, after the uh, amnesty, majority of Polish Jews, as I mentioned, moved to the uh, Central Asia and um, until 33 were there. But in, in the end of 33, um, 
another army formation was made. I only want to mention um, the documents uh, of Anders' army. Where can they be found? Uh, first of all, uh, Polish Institute and Sikorsky Museum in London um, has the documents of uh, Polish government in exile and many documents of Polish refugees. Also, War Imperial Museum in London uh, has the documentation of Anders Army um, participants, soldiers, and officers, because this army um, officially was under British authorities. Uh, Hoover Institute in Stanford University has the collection also of um, uh, that they received from uh, former Polish government in exile. And uh, after arriving to the Palestine, um, many of the documents of those who were Jews can be found in, in the Israel Defense Force and Defense Establishment Archives. Um, so these are tips where the ways of searching for the, those who were included in arm, this army. Now, as I mentioned, uh, in the end of 43, uh, new army formation uh, started. And now it's called uh, Bering's Army. Uh, a Polish uh, general, uh, uh, Hen uh, Zygmunt Henrik uh, Berlings, um, started to formate uh, the second Polish army under the cover of Union of Polish Patriots, uh, who were communists and um, uh, it was on the territory of Soviet Union. Uh, I have to say that many of Polish Jews who uh, when the Soviet Union wanted to be drafted voluntary, uh, they wanted to struggle and to fight with Nazis. And they also wanted um, to, many of them uh, thought about uh, leaving Soviet Union this way. Uh, this army was part of uh, Belarusian front uh, in Soviet army. And um, they arrived um, to Warsaw, they liberated Warsaw, and they moved further to Berlin as part of the Belarusian uh, Front. I want to mention that uh, because of being part of the Soviet army, the documents of these uh, soldiers um, can be searched in, so in Russian archives. I want to show the picture of these soldiers uh, from the sources from the USHMM. Um, these are Jewish soldiers from uh, Berlin's army. Now, this uh, website called Pamit Naroda uh, is in Russian, unfortunately. This is a database of uh, Soviet soldiers and officers uh, of World War II. Um, many of those who were in Berlin's army can be searched here by the name. Uh, unfortunately, not all of those po Polish uh, citizens who were in Soviet army can be found. Uh, from my experience, I realized that those who just um, run away from the army uh, after the liberation uh, are not here. I I'm, I'm not sure, com not completely sure why, but I think because of their just leaving without permission. Anyway, it's a source to try to search. They also have uh, interesting documentation, uh, not for the name searching, but, but for the researching the history of this um, phenomenon. Uh, they have journal of combat operations of, of these troops, uh, which original materials are kept in central archives of the Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation, but these materials are online. And if somebody wants to research um, what's happened to these Polish Jews, uh, during this um, combat operation, it's, it's uh, available online. So uh, now let's move to the Central Asia. Uh, living in Central Asia was rather difficult. Many of Polish Jews um, wanted to arrive to Uzbekistan. The reason was warm climate and also popular at that time book called Tashkent City of Bread. It was published in even in 20s and translated to many languages, including Yiddish. And it was kind of um, understanding that uh, it is possible to find food in Uzbekistan. Anyway, it was hunger and the conditions were really difficult. Uh, uh, sometimes people lived in barracks, sometimes refugees were resettled among the local population. Um, bread was uh, issued by the card. So here you can see an example 
of such uh, ration cards uh, of bread. And it's uh, January 42. And it's uh, written here that is uh, the uh, day um, ration for the child is for uh, 400 gram of, of the bread. So um, what is also important for, for that period in Central Asia is marketplace, as I think, because it played uh, a role not only in provision, but also in communication. There was almost no money, and so money did not really had value at that time. People exchanged goods, it was black market, uh, Polish refugees who managed to bring something valuable from their home uh, could exchange uh, this item for the food. Uh, it was valuable because it was unknown for local population. It was some, maybe sometimes strange and interesting for them. Uh, but people not only exchange goods, they also learned at market um, last news and rumors about the situation. People could communicate. And we are speaking about people from um, different regions of different nationalities who were at the same time at the same place. Because of this um, inter... Uh, uh, because of many uh, dif different people from different places, we have to speak about inter-ethnic relationships. Um, Jews were only a small part of all the refugees who arrived to uh, Uzbekistan and all other countries of Central Asia. So uh, there were different types of relationships between refugees and evacuees. And who were refugees and evacuees? Let's, let's understand. Uh, refugees, we are speaking about Polish Jews who were deported or uh, who ran away themselves to the east. Evacuated, there were Soviet uh, citizens who were evacuated by authorities or arrived by their own, but they were registered as Soviet citizens in the places of their arrival. And in many cases, this registration allowed them to receive uh, permission to work and to receive ration cards, which were really very important. So, um, and it was also a um, kind of relationship with the local population. Before uh, World War II, in these distant uh, districts like Central Asia or Siberia, there were no anti Semitism actually. And in these places, it arrived together, this phenomenon arrived together with uh, other evacuees, non Jewish evacuees from Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. And it was really also. Um, uh, very prominent uh, during uh, this time in Central Asia. Anyway, uh, cultural life was really rich. Uh, for example, to uh, Tashkent, uh, many cultural institutions uh, were recreated. Um, academies of music and art, theaters. Um, you can see here um, um, the painting of the very um, famous uh, painter Mayor Axelrod, who, who uh, worked at that time at Tashkent. Um, I um, paid attention uh, in the um, memories. Um, uh, Jewish, uh, former Jewish evacuees mentioned that at that time there were many uh, concerts and um, uh, all kind of performances in Yiddish. And uh, for Jewish actors, it was rather an unusual situation because they had really big public in their performances. Uh, and their uh, places uh, of living before the war, there were not so many uh, people who could uh, arrive to their concerts also. Uh, there were concerts of Yiddish songs. And there is a very interesting uh, research nowadays about Jewish songs in Central Asia. So it also can be listened. There is a um, collection which was published. Now, uh, the issue of religious life is also very important. Uh, many of Polish Jews were religious, but in Soviet Union, almost 20 years already when the war started, religious was forbidden. So Soviet Jews were not religion in general, but there was uh, some groups, uh, for example, Chabadniks, uh, who were religion and who uh, lived religious life uh, in underground way. So um, in many cases, we can find evidence that Polish Jews um, uh, just uh, together with Chabadniks uh, participated 
in uh, uh, all kind of, uh, uh, I would say they send their children to uh, Heather, they uh, participate in kosher kitchen, and uh, they were organized uh, yeshiva, they uh, celebrated Jewish holidays, and all of these uh, um, were made uh, by underground. Uh, and so uh, we can say that that time, the connections between religious Soviet Jews and Polish Jews uh, were established, which um, helped some Soviet Jews after that escape Soviet Union. I'll speak in a while about this phenomenon too. I want to present you several uh, kinds of documents where uh, the names can be searched. Uh, here you can see the card file of uh, Tashkent refugees. Um, there are 152,000 uh, Jews who were recorded in these card files. Uh, the original cards are in Uzbekistan State Archives. Yad Vashem has uh, copies of this. Uh, cards, it's index available online. I only want to mention that majority of people who are recorded in these cards are non-Polish refugees, uh, but Soviet evacuees. Anyway, um, here, for example, you can see the card of uh, Abramovich Chaya, who was originally from Grodno, um, and uh, before 39, it was part of Poland. That means that she was former Polish citizen and it was included in Soviet citizens um, after the NSM, uh, after the occupation of Soviet, of Poland by Soviet Union. Uh, another uh, source uh, can be found in the Polish Institute of Sikorsky. Uh, you can see Polish uh, list of Polish Jewish civilians evacuated. Uh, we are speaking about forty two. Uh, once more, all these lists are partial. We don't have a complete list of refugees. And also, as you can see here in the picture, there is no information. We have only uh, last name, first name, and date of birth. It's, it's really difficult to search something in such lists. Um, another interesting source, um, we are speaking about already the end of the war, a uh, list of Polish uh, Jewish refugees who were still in the USSR. Um, this list was com were completed by World Jewish Congress. And today we can find this list in the uh, database of arts and archives. Also, there are not many uh, people who were recorded in this list. But if we found uh, our relatives in this list, it's interestingly, uh, we can find the address where they were at that time. Now, repatriation. This is very important phenomenon. So um, in uh, July 1945, Soviet, um, Soviet signed an agreement with Polish government about repatriation. Uh, it was exchange of um, people and also materials. We are speaking about uh, ethnic Poles and uh, Polish Jews who were allowed to repatriate back to Poland. Um, and also we are speaking about people who had uh, Polish passport uh, before World War started, before 39. That means that those who were in the territories annexed by Soviet also could repatriate back to Poland. Um, so there are no many materials um, nowadays that are indexed and can be searched by names, but I want to present you some. This is, for example, um, for uh, thousands of people who were in, uh, recorded in these materials are indexed, recorded in the list of Polish citizens who were uh, who came back from uh, North region in 1946. Um, we also can find materials about these repatriees in the archives of the places which were on the border of Soviet Union of, uh, where uh, repatriees uh, went through. And here you can see an example from state, uh, Central State Archives of the highest authorities of the Ukraine. Uh, there are also materials um, about all this phenomenon of repatriation in the Central Archives of Russian Federation. Uh, as I understand now, there is no access to these materials. And I'm not sure if there are um, lists of repatriees in these materials. I suppose it's more administrative records, but just to know they have such a collection. 
Um, now, this is uh, an example of approval for the repatriation. So uh, the, we have it because somebody donate, who, who kept it at home donated to Yad Vashem. And we can see an example of what it is. Uh, each repatriate uh, received a kind of approval that he, ha he has a right to repatriate. It's, it was uh, for free. Uh, they traveled by the train. Uh, so this is how it looks like. But uh, what is interesting, I want uh, to mention um, very interesting um, page in this history. Um, not all those people who uh, repatriated um, were Polish Jews. Uh, there was a rather big group of those who were Soviet uh, citizens, but who wanted uh, to run away from the Soviet Union because of the different reasons, specifically uh, those who were religious. It was a big group of Chabadniks. As, as I mentioned, they uh, started their relationships with Polish Jews uh, in Central Asia. And also another group were Zionists from Lithuania and Latvia, who were part of Soviet Union after the war. And they didn't have um, uh, official right to leave the Soviet Union, but they wanted to arrive to the Palestine. So, um, Together with the organization Bricha, who helped um, Jews to escape Soviet Union, there were several hundreds, we don't know exact number, from several hundreds to several thousand Jews who um, ran away from Soviet Union together with Soviet, uh, Polish repatriates. And I want to mention here the quotation from the book of Rabbi Gershuni, uh, who was um, a member of Chabad uh, movement, and uh, he wrote, uh, a book, The Struggle of Chabad Hasidim over immigration from the Soviet Union. Uh, so what happened, uh, sometimes people uh, married and uh, it was a kind of official way when one of the um, spouses could uh, live together with the wife with husband, for example. Uh, there were uh, really cases when rabbis allowed uh, uh, religious Polish uh, Jews to divorce in order to marry with um, those who were non-Polish uh, citizens in order to uh, allow additional family uh, to leave Soviet Union. So there were false marriages. And also here, look, there were false documents. I'm quoting, after some time, I managed to buy documents and it was with difficulties. Our family then consisted of four people, my, me, my wife and two children. The oldest was seven years old, and the youngest was one year old and nine months. In, uh, in the board passport, only three were recorded, husband, wife, and a little child. My age, as well as the age of my wife and youngest son, approximately corresponded with the data entered to the documents of this person. But what about the older son? Handwriting fake specialist added another line. However, it turned out that the name of the former uh, older son is inscribed after the name of the younger brother. Uh, now the document looked uh, outright fake. Why all the child is recorded after the younger? NKVD officer checking passport at the border maybe ask uh, this question rather um, unsatisfactory. The answer will entail the known 20 or 25 years of prison and exile in the worst. We were allowed the danger of the undertaking, but uh, there were no another way out. So it shows us, I think, um, really the situation, how it happened. This family managed to escape uh, to, the, to Poland and after that uh, to immigrate to Israel. Um, as I told, there was another group uh, of Zionists um, uh, who are together with the organization Bricha tried to uh, help people to escape Soviet Union. Uh, and there were several points where they could do it in Vilnius, uh, in uh, uh, Baranovich, which is um, Western Belarusia, and also in Lvov, which is Western Ukraine. So there were two leaders uh, of this uh, movement, um, uh, Yakov Yankilovich, which after that um, took name Yakov Yanai, and the second one, Samuel Yoffe. Um, they were uh, two young guys from uh, Riga, Latvia, and they really organized uh, escaping uh, uh, remnants uh, of Jews 
from Soviet Union, those who were Zionists, they were um, kept um, and uh, were under the trial. They both were sent to Gulag. Um, Emmanuel uh, Joffe died in Gulag. And uh, after the death of Stalin, uh, these people were released. Uh, this is only an example uh, because there were many uh, trials of this kind, uh, but these two persons were leaders. So uh, Yaakov Yenai was released and he immigrated to uh, Israel and he was a head of Natif uh, organization in Israel. He wrote a book about all this story called Mulka, Escape from the USSR, Mulka Samuel, his friend. And uh, it's, the book is translated into English. I think it's a very interesting story. I want to show you, this is an example of um, such uh, trial files uh, from Latin state archives. Uh, this is, for example, from people, uh, Feldman, Khmelnytska and Harash, uh, people who work also under trial and receive um, uh, 10 years of uh, gulags, forced labor camps. Um, this is, I only wanted to show you how uh, these documents are looked like. This is a restaurant. The language, uh, for those who maybe understand Russian, the language is very much bureaucratic and administrative, and the words kind of betray uh, the motherland. Um, it's very much prominent here. So, um, those who left Soviet Union and the, the biggest wave of uh, escaping uh, of repatriates from Soviet Union was in 1946. Uh, they arrived to Poland and they stayed in, in several cities where at that time um, was a Jewish community. And they were recorded in so-called Central Committee of Polish Jews, CKJP. Uh, these documents nowadays are kept in GIG. Uh, Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. And this is very uh, important and interesting card file. Uh, this Central uh, Committee of Polish Jews was organized already in 44 when some towns uh, were liberated. Um, the goal of this card file was to record the survivors and to understand how many people survived, well, where they survived, what happened to them, and uh, to write down their uh, present address in order to uh, locate relatives. And people voluntarily went to registrate because they wanted to find uh, their relatives and to know what's happened to them. You can see here the, an example of this card of Zhigno Simcha, and you can see that he mentioned he was in the Soviet Union, the city written uh, USSR on the left side. Uh, we also can find here information about uh, relatives. And here he mentioned that he had relatives in Argentina, uh, his present address, the way uh, he left through uh, in Soviet Union and many personal details. Uh, there are about 300,000 cards of, of, this far, of this kind in, in Zich, uh, that, um in this card file, we're speaking about uh, 250,000 people. Sometimes people are registered several times when they move from city to city in order to um, allow their relatives to find them. Now, um, after uh, being short time in Poland, uh, and we know that in 1946, it was a very difficult time because of pogroms. The wolf uh, very known uh, programs in different towns, uh, specifically uh, Kelce, it's, uh, where um, many Jews were killed. Uh, Polish Jews did not stay in Poland. With the help of an organization, Bricha, which is escape in Hebrew, um, they left Poland uh, to the direction of uh, DP camps, displaced person camps, um, which were in um, American and British zone. So um, what, what are DP camps? After the end of World War II, the Western uh, Allies established displaced person camps um, in allied occupation zones of Germany, Austria, and Italy. And the first inhabitants of those camps were uh, former concentration camp uh, in, uh, prisoners, um, forced to begin uh, solving the survivors' problems locally. 
And within weeks after liberation, uh, Allied occupation forces began to uh, setting temporary living uh, centers near Meiji camps. These camps, uh, the DP centers, housed um, uh, not only Jews, they were, they were also Gentiles from Eastern Europe uh, who refused um, repatriation. The term displaced persons referred to anyone who had been uprooted as a result of the war or uh, refused to return to their home. Um, that time in September 1945, there were about 150,000 Jews in DP camps. Uh, in the beginning, as I mentioned, Holocaust survivors were together with uh, a non-Jewish uh, uh, displaced person, and it uh, was really a difficult situation because many, there were many cases where the Jews were harmed. Uh, there were former Nazi collaborators who were next to Jews. So um, in September 45, Earl Harrison, U.S. President uh, Emissary, visited uh, the camps in the American zone of occupation and uh, wrote a report um, about suffering of Jewish population there. As a result, Jewish refugees were transferred to separate camps um, where they were given a degree of independence and conditions uh, improved. Uh, also, um, all kinds of Jewish organizations at that time entered the P camps, um, joint distribution committee, uh, uh, also uh, organizations from Palestine. Um, so in British zone, uh, the major uh, camp was Bergen-Belsen. Uh, the conditions were more strict there. In the American zone, there were more open door policy. Uh, population of displaced persons uh, were shifted constantly, making it difficult to estimate the exact number. And so in early 46, uh, there were close to 70,000 Jews displaced persons in Germany, uh, for example, and um, it were about uh, uh, also 12,000 in Austria and 10,000 in Italy. But by the end of this year, and here we're going back to our uh, wave of, of repatriates, uh, the number of displaced persons uh, arised uh, to 230,000, including 180,000 uh, in Germany alone. And also, we are speaking here about uh, this big wave of Polish Jews who arrived to displaced person camps. Uh, so a uh, majority of them uh, stayed there for about uh, several years. There were uh, people who wanted really to arrive to Palestine and who uh, tried to, to do it illegally. And there were about uh, 70,000 who arrived to the Palestine illegally, but majority left DP camps uh, after the state of Israel was established. Uh, if we are speaking about those who uh, made Aliyah to Israel. But there were people who uh, wanted to immigrate to the United States. You can see here uh, a card of such person. This is the same person that we saw, uh, his card from the KJP, Zitner's uh, Sever, this is the same person. The desired destination here is written USA. And what I have to mention here, uh, US government had a policy um, they didn't want to allow uh, Polish, former Polish uh, Jews who won the Soviet Union uh, to arrive as refugees to the United States. Uh, they really published such a paper in 1948 uh, that Polish uh, Jews um, who won the Soviet Union are undesirable refugees. Uh, the government was afraid um, to receive communism together with this Polish uh, repertory is uh, actually it was really big mistake. The these uh, Polish Jews uh, run away from communism, but still uh, they were not allowed to uh, enter because of that. In many documents from the DP camps and this aftermath period, we can see the a kind of contradictory with the real story. They were afraid to mention that they were in the Soviet Union. They mentioned that they were in different places, not in the Soviet Union. So uh, it's very important to pay attention to this phenomenon uh, when we want to understand the real story of Polish Jewish refugees. This is, for example, cards of person who was born in 1945, uh, just after the war already. And it's written here, he was born in Wrocław. This is the place where this family arrived when they repatriated to Poland. But we know from 
other document that this person was born in, in the Ural Mountains. So the, his parents did not want to mention this. Because the reason was really that I mentioned uh, they were afraid uh, to show that uh, the child was born in the United uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, in many cards, we can find um, the desired destination is Palestine. Uh, actually, in the PKM Zionist ideology was very strong, uh, and this is the reason why many of um, DPs wrote a desired destination Palestine. Um, all these cards are kept in the Arizon archives, uh, which. Uh, original documents are in Germany in this town by Darrelson, but um, Yad Vashem is official copy holder of these archives and also uses it to mem official copy holder. So the materials can be found uh, online in Arzen, but also can be uh, searched in Yad Vashem um, by arriving to our reading room. Uh, this is also, uh, I'm speaking about the same family, his mother, uh, Rachela uh, mentioned that she was born in Vilna. Uh, actually, she was, wasn't born in Vilna, but those who uh, mentioned that they were born in Vilna, um, they meant that they were born in the pre-war Poland and they could repatriate uh, from Soviet Union. And this is the father of this child. So we can see that sometimes we have photographs, which is, I think, very important to see. Uh, this family uh, mentioning Palestine uh, um, anywhere uh, immigrated to Canada. We also can see the list of um, immigration to Canada in 1949. And here, uh, interestingly, uh, this child mentioned uh, being born in Chilabinsk. This is the Ural Mountains. Now, going back to Zvitner uh, Sever, uh, I want to show you this tracing documentation. This documentation was made in 50s and 60s already, and still those who were in Soviet Union did not mention that they were there. Uh, they wrote all kinds of uh, places uh, that could not be traced, and here um, we cannot understand exactly where this person was. Um, Another example of this kind I want to show you. Um, Gordon Heim uh, mentioned that he was born in Vilna and he uh, explained in the tracing documentation of arts and archives uh, that he was in all uh, different kinds of um, forced labor camps. Uh, ZAL is forced labor camps. We're speaking about Nazi forced labor camps, not Soviet. Uh, and he was in concentration camps, Stutthof, and he was liberated. Uh, there, but after that, she wa he was in Fahrenwald a DP camp, and in '49, immigrated to Australia. Uh, in '71, Heim Gordon gave testimony to Yad Vashem in the Yiddish, and he mentions there his real story. Uh, he was born in this town Daugavpils, uh, which is Latvia. That means that he didn't have right uh, to. Uh, repatriate from Soviet Union. He really wanted to escape. Because of that, he changed um, his story. He was not in these camps. He was uh, in ghetto, and he uh, ran away from ghetto. Um, he was in partisan division. Uh, so the story is different uh, totally. But um, uh, searching the different sources, uh, we can find sometimes um, the real story. But we need to search small pieces uh, and to collect it like a puzzle to understand the real story. As I mentioned, uh, many of those who uh, uh, wanted to arrive to Palestine made it uh, illegally uh, by the ships. Uh, many were uh, kept catch by British authorities, uh, starting from 1946 and sent to Cyprus. There were more than 50,000 Jews uh, there who tried to arrive to Palestine and were allowed to left uh, only by the establishment uh, of uh, the state of Israel. Um, now, um, when I started to, uh, to uh, speak about uh, refugees in Tehran, I mentioned the story of thousands, about thousand uh, Jewish children. I want to uh, speak a little bit about this story. Uh, last week, it was uh, 80 years, uh, February 18, uh, of arriving these children to Palestine. 
and um, you can see this is the map of their traveling. That it's just uh, you can see it's it's so long way from Poland. We are the Soviet Union to the north, and after that to the Central Asia. After that, by the uh, sea, Caspian Sea, uh, they were to Tehran, and after that we are Egypt uh, to Palestine. So um, these children arrived, as I mentioned, in uh, February 1943. Uh, they were settled in Kibbutzim uh, in Israel. Uh, I want to show you several pictures. Uh, it was really a long process of several months. Uh, when they arrived to Tehran, they were a negotiation of um, Jewish agency representatives with British authorities in order to allow them to enter the Palestine. And the rallies of these children in Yad Vashem archives and in many ma materials are in Central Zionist archives in, in Jerusalem. Um, I want to show you uh, this map and to tell the story of uh, two children from this group, uh, brothers and sister Emil and uh, Elena Landau. Uh, they were from a very established family in Warsaw. Um, uh, their father was a, the lawyer, mother was musician. When the war started, um, they traveled by their own car because they were really uh, rich people. Uh, to the east, uh, they arrived to the city of Rovno, which is Western Ukraine. And that time it was Soviet uh, Union already. Uh, their father was drafted uh, forcibly uh, to the Soviet army. And mother, together with children, was sent to the uh, forced labor camp in on the north of Russia. Um, it was difficult. There were very difficult conditions there. Um, after amnesty in 41, the family together with other refugees moved to the um, Uzbekistan. Uh, they arrived to Samarkand. Um, their father arrived also there, but he was um, ill with typhus. And after three days with family, he died. Uh, mother didn't have um, food for children. As many of uh, Jewish mothers, mothers she uh, sent her children to Polish orphanages. And it was non-Jewish Polish uh, Catholic orphanages. When the uh, process of organizing Anders Army to get with the refugees started, these uh, brother and sister were included um, to this group of, uh, who left the Soviet Union together with Anders Army. They arrived uh, in February 43 to Palestine. And that time, uh, uh, Elena was 10 years old. Her brother wrote her this um, card. And we can see a map with their traveling. And he wrote that he, um, he wished her successful studying of Hebrew. And he also wished her to meet uh, the, the mother. Uh, they did not know the time that their mother died of starvation already. Um, so they uh, were settled in kibbutz. This is their traveling. Uh, they were settled in kibbutz. Uh, you can see here, Ginegar, and this is a picture of 1945. Um, when war, in independence war in Israel in 1948 started, Emil um, was drafted and he was killed in the battle. So Elena uh, was alone uh, and when she grew up, she went to study social worker. Uh, she wanted to, to help children in need because she knew what it is. She donated us um, all this family materials, a map uh, and photographs together with uh, story. It's very important to, to tell the story in order to commemorate and to remember what happened to this people. Uh, I also wanted to uh, mention several books. Uh, I think uh, last year the topic of Polish Jews and the US society really went up in the research. Uh, last year there were several books published um, on this topic and very good research made. I want to recommend this book, Polish Jews in the Soviet Union, um, edited by Katharina Friedland, Marcus uh, Nisler wrote. 
um, another important book uh, by Iliana Adler. Uh, and also, um, it was really published in the end of 22, uh, the collection of 150 testimonies of Polish Jews who were in the Soviet Union, uh, translated into English. Uh, we really can uh, find here um, all, all these stories, what happened to these people, and to understand better um, the whole phenomenon, what happened there. Um, so this is the end of my presentation, and I'll be happy to answer the question. I, I suppose there are many questions should be about this. Okay, I'm back now. Yes, many questions have come in. So I am um, going to start with, um, let's see. From near the beginning of your presentation, um, is there a database of soldiers in Anders Army? As I mentioned, the materials can be found in different sources. There is no one database. Yeah. So I mentioned several sources. When uh, you send the handout, there are uh, links to different organizations. Okay. But actually, as I know, uh, they are recorded in the Imperial Museum in London. And even I heard the story that somebody of the descendants uh, received some medals of, of their <laughs> parents uh, who didn't receive that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, one second. Okay. Um, were Jews in the Soviet Union's army assigned to their own units or were they just among everyone else? No, they were among everyone. Okay. And actually, um, in this book of Katarina Friedler, it's a very good chapter that she wrote about soldiers in the Soviet Union. She mentioned all this, including anti-Semitism and uh, how Jews, it was a phenomenon when Jewish soldiers uh, changed their names in order not to, to, to be so prominent with their name, names. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Um, we had multiple questions about how you can find out which camp or town your family was sent to. That's what I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, it's very difficult to find out, unfortunately. Yeah. So I can only if, recommend if a, to- If the person knows the, the, a nearby town, um, one person said his family was sent to Krasnoyarsk. Or around there? Krasnoyarsk is a very big city. Okay. So, uh, so there are sometimes, there are also books sometimes with the research about this camp. So it can be searched, but to, to find a original list, I'm not sure it's possible. Mm -hmm. Only in general, we can search. Got it. I would okay. say that a majority of the material that can be found uh, from the aftermath period, from uh, when they repatriated back to Poland and uh, left for the Pecans. Uh, almost in all the cases, it can be traced. Ah, uh, okay. So if, they if there is a post-war record of them, then that, yeah, that might exactly include information I mean, yeah. about where they were during the war in different, yeah. Uh, it's sometimes reaching the truth, but sometimes, as I mentioned, they try oh, right. to find a way further. It's not always the truth, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see here. Okay, there are two questions about how people traveled. Um, I'll start with the first one. How would Jews from the USSR have traveled to Uzbekistan or Iran? in 1941, 1942? By train. By train, okay. Yeah. And then it's probably a similar answer. Uh, how would Polish Jews sent to Siberia have returned to Europe after the war? That's what I mentioned. They actually, they had um, those who received approval, uh, they received a ticket to train. They mm -hmm. organized many trains in 46. Uh, okay. There were trains uh, inside the USSR uh, until the border, and there was a train uh, which moved uh, through the border to Bialystok and the, to Krakow and this area. Okay. 
Let's see. But I wanted to also to mention there were many who uh, left illegally by the, by the border. I mean, it's, we cannot mm -hmm. trace it, unfortunately, but only with the testimonies we can find out that. Uh, interesting. The, okay, so returning back to Kras, Krasnoyarsk, uh, mm -hmm. somebody asked, did Jews who have been exiled to Siberia in 1868 assist these refugees? I mean, I imagine that's like 70 years earlier, so I don't know how many would have been alive, but. 68? Yeah. Uh, actually, that's not connected to World War II period. Uh, yeah. There were repressions in the Soviet Union. There were many people who were sent to uh, forced labor camps, Gulag. Mm -hmm. But um, if they were Polish Jews, it's, that means they were, I suppose, it's, I'm, I'm not sure, but I suppose they were communists who arrived themselves to Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. I, otherwise, they could not be uh, sent there. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of new ones of, that have new questions that have come in since you stopped uh, your presentation. Um, You're welcome. Let's see. Uh, do you have any guidance on researching Bundists in Uzbekistan? Research what? Bundists. Ah, Bund Bundists. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I know I have to say. That's okay, uh, it's a very specific question. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I just never researched that. I suppose maybe some materials in evil mm -hmm. in your place. <laughs> yes, potentially, that's true. Because after that, when they arrived uh, to, the, to Poland, but um, as I know, many of those who were Bundis, they also stayed in Poland after the war, they didn't leave. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there are some materials in Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Okay. But I always suppose, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly. That's, a, that's totally fine. Um, okay. Um. So a number of people wrote about post-war, um, essentially asking where did uh, the Polish, where did most of the Polish Jews who were in the USSR uh, end up after the war? Um, I don't know. Is there Actually, any, yeah, we can there, find- Is there any place to look yeah. for like numbers of people who ended up in the US or yeah. Israel or other places? In Israel, we know approximately because, let's say this way, um, this is the biggest group of uh, survivors, uh, those who survived in the Soviet Union, about 230,000. Mm -hmm. uh, as I understand, majority left uh, for Israel. Uh, those who, I don't know exactly the, how many people arrived to the United States. I suppose it can be searched in the groups of uh, Latzmannschaft. I mean, uh, those who were from specific places. And also if you're searching for uh, specific names, as I know, uh, not long ago, the census of 1950 was published online. So these people can be found there. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, someone asks, did the Soviets pay for the transportation of the Jews to Uzbekistan? To Uzbekistan? Yeah. Uh, no. From no. Uzbekistan, I mean, uh, they traveled for free uh, to Poland, but- okay. uh, Not to Uzbekistan. No, no. Yeah. It um, wasn't well organized. Many people just also went by foot, many kilometers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't- uh, Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't organized, so people went however they could, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Oh, somebody recommended a documentary called Saved by Documentation. Have you heard of that one? Documentary? A, a documentary film called Saved by Documentation? No, no, I don't know okay. that. It's look like about the uh, trees. Oh, interesting question uh, and a follow up question. Do you know how many? Um, no, I think you mentioned this already. How? Uh, never mind. Why are the Jews who were at the USSR camps never considered to be survivors? Oh, this is an important question. Uh, first of all, now did they consider survivors? I have to say, I think now did they also receive a compensation from Climate Conference. Uh, the policy who were considered survivors changed during during the years. One of the reasons why we can see this uh, change stories in tracing documentation in arts and archives, because in 50s and 60s, when people applied for their uh, compensation, um, those who were in Soviet Union were considered refugees and not survivors. So they didn't receive compensation. But with the uh, changing in um, discourse of the Holocaust, and uh, really nowadays, uh, many uh, groups included um, in the understanding of survivors, including uh, those, for example, who were evacuees, they also received compensation, and also Polish Jews, um, because Yes, they were not under the Nazi occupation, but the reason that they were in Soviet Union was Nazi occupation. So they are considered survivors nowadays. Uh, let's see. There's so many different questions. No, no, um, yo, yo, I'm here. <laughs> oh, this is yo, an interesting so. question um, that you can choose whether you'd like to answer or not, but relating to current events, uh, how similar are the events that you've discussed? Uh, how similar are they to the current uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel that it's unfortunately looks similar, but um, the, the said, is that we unfortunately don't learn from the history. But I really don't want to compare because it's mm -hmm. another historical situation. Okay. Um, let's see how much time we have. I think we have time for a few more questions. Oh, speaking about the claims conference, uh, are children of survivors eligible for compensation? Do you know As that? I know, no. Second okay. generation do doesn't receive compensation. Okay. But uh, I also know there are some uh, cases nowadays uh, considering uh, Romanian Jews, they, uh, when second generation can receive compensation because their parents didn't receive it, but it's not con con connect concerning Polish Jews. Okay. In general, second generation doesn't receive compensation. Uh, but this is a special case, right? Because they weren't because this, they weren't considered survivors for a long time, right? Yeah. But actually, this is the question to Clans Conference. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. about compensation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you know uh, how common it was for Jews who were forcibly drafted into the Soviet army to to have escaped or deserted? Uh, yeah, I, actually, uh, they were drafted. Um, if we are speaking about uh, forty four, those who were barreling army. They were drafted voluntarily. They wanted to be drafted. But anyway, after the liberation, many of them escaped, just left uh, to, illegally to, to Poland. Okay. Um, somebody tried contacting the Russian State Archives for documentation about 
Jews who were uh, evacuated or deported, um, but they never received a, a reply. Do you have any tips on how um, to? No, unfortunately, I don't have tips how to contact Russian archives. Um, if we're speaking about once more, I, we, we need to understand there is a difference between evacuees and and uh, and Polish refugees. Those who were evacuated, they were Soviet citizens. And for example, in the Russian uh, Red Cross, there is a very big part file of uh, those who were evacuees. And also in, in the Russian state archive, there are lists of evacuees, and yet Vashem has uh, almost all this list uh, indexed. Um, we have about 900,000 names of Jews indexed and available online with the scans of those who were evacuated. But these are not Polish uh, refugees because of that I didn't yeah. speak about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just saw some question about Jig. Maybe I will mention what Jig is Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. This is a uh, very important institution uh, about Jewish history with uh, amazing documentation. Uh, so just uh, search, uh, I'll, I'll send the link, but uh, it's searchable in Google Jewish Historical Institute. Uh, there is one question in Hebrew. I don't know if you want to read I it. I don't see it. Let it's, me... it's near the bottom. Okay. It's uh, Yossi Spiegel. I don't see it, sorry, just a moment. Oh, that's then. okay. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't find it. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, Yossi asked, is asking if there is a uh, records from Kazakhstan. Okay. Unfortunately, from Kazakhstan is less records from than from Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that sometimes it's possible to uh, trace uh, in, in local archive, the records if somebody died, for example, they and buried in, in, the, in the place. Sometimes it's possible to, but to tell the truth, uh, it's easier to find when you find a local researcher because uh, local archives are not really answering, if I know. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is another um, question about who is considered survivors. Um, how many children were born in the USSR to Polish Jews during the war? And were they were these children considered to be uh, Polish survivors? Okay, so I don't know the number. I don't know how many, but what I know about considering survivors, if the child was born um, during 10 months after his mother was uh, running and can, can the evidences can be found, this person is considered survivors. Even they, they took 10, 10 months, not nine even. This person is considered survivor. That means if um, a Jewish mother ran away in 41 and this child uh, were born in the beginning of 42, it, they can find that it can be considered survivor. Okay. Um, but all this question actually uh, can be asked in CLIMS conference because this this is their field of uh, right disability. Yeah. Um, interesting question. Do you know how many Polish Jews fled? into the USSR um, bec uh, because they were communists um, as opposed to, uh, I, I don't know, I guess as so earlier on when that was more of the focus of uh, the Nazis, yeah. Yeah, I think those Polish Jews who were communists stayed in Poland. They didn't leave for DP camps. There were several thousands, hundred thousands of Pol Polish Jews who stayed. Um, many of them changed their names and uh, now that their descendants not really know they were Jewish, 
but they stayed in Poland. Maybe they left in 57 or 68 when there were another waves of immigration. But their mm -hmm. time, this was a big mistake by Americans to consider these Polish Jews communists. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yeah, you mentioned that before, for sure. Um, there's a lot of uh, duplication, so you, all of you out there are on, uh, on the same wavelength, looks like. Um, oh, when did uh, America change its policy about letting in Polish refugees who came from the USSR? I don't think they changed. <laughs> it was connected to Cold War. Uh, Cold War. Cold War, yeah. So only yeah. until that. Yeah, got it. Okay. I will do one more question, I think. Oh, the film that I mentioned earlier was actually called Saved by Deportation. Do you know that one? Sounds familiar, but I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that I know. Okay. Um. The rest of the questions are getting pretty specific. So one more uh, one more question. Who actually completed the um, DP uh, registration cards? Was it uh, ah, clerks okay. or were, was it by the refugees themselves? No, no, there were authorities. Uh, there were American authorities. Yeah, that's what I would have thought as well. Sometimes okay. we can see cards from uh, which were completed by JDC also, Joint Distribution mm -hmm. Committee. But that was also by uh, staff of the JDC, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, lastly, I would like to ask for you to um, please put your contact information in the chat box. Uh, can you do that now? Uh, it's better to, if you want to apply to, wait, to, uh, to, we have chat, uh, yeah, we have chat board. Uh, it's better to, if, if you want to apply to Yad Vashem for searching, it's better to apply uh, via a website to fill out the online form with the reference and information services. Uh, maybe I'll put here, just a second, I'll find the link and I'll, I'm putting here. Okay. It's, it, it will, you can ask me something while I'm searching. It, it will take a moment. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, so the, the person that previously was that I mentioned that asked the question about the Russian state archives. Yeah. He says he was asking about Polish Jews who fled to uh, border cities and then were deported to Russia. Uh, I'm not sure it's available. It's not in Russian state archives, such, such okay. things. Okay. Yeah. Just a moment. Okay. I'm 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 putting to the chat box. Just a second. Uh, an information service. There we go. So uh, just apply us with the request. We are answering everybody. It can take some time, but we'll answer. Okay, thank you. And a couple more questions about your handout. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you will have, the handout will contain links to the websites that you mentioned. Uh, will you, yeah. does it also contain the names of the books that you recommend? I can put it. Okay, so thank you. And also, will it have that uh, that same link to your uh, contact page? Okay, I'll do yeah. it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
with that, I think we are reaching the end of today's program. I want to thank Seema again for her wonderful uh, presentation and such knowledgeable um, uh, responses to everyone's questions. And uh, thank you, thank you all out there for attending today, especially uh, those from the West Coast who woke up really early to, to be here and those from Israel who are watching. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I'd like to say. Have, uh, have a great day and we look forward to uh, seeing you at our next program. Thank you.